Uh, welcome, everyone. I am uh, happy to uh, welcome you here for our annual holiday brunch and vendor showcase. I'm hoping you'll all stick around after the service and, and avail yourself to all these wonderful goodies that are, that are displayed in the back of our sanctuary. It'll be a wonderful morning. And <clears throat> before I go any further, I want to thank our uh, hospitality team. Yeah. As usual, when I want go to thank uh, our, the, the key members of our hospitality team, they're busy getting ready for hospitality, so they're not in here right now. That's Kathy Story and Tony Sparks, so I hope that, <laughs> hope that if you see them this morning, you'll thank them there. They have a, a wonderful assistant in Dan Martin. Thank you, Dan Martin. <laughs> And I know there are so many others of you that, are, that help with hospitality and, you know, we always feel welcomed by all your service to our beautiful community, so thank you. And thank you vendors for coming in and bringing all your beautiful wares. Ah, so here we are in December, right? Wow, how did that happen? <laughs> it's hard to believe that 2023 is on its way out and we're about to say hello to 2024. We've been uh, working with this wonderful topic all year of living out loud. We've looked at all these different ways of living out loud. And uh, last month we talked about the sacred and we looked at things that maybe we didn't think were so sacred and how they could be sacred. And the, um, this month it's wholeness, which is a perfect way to wrap up our, um, our year-long theme of living out loud. And so this idea of living as wholeness, um, of course, I went to the dictionary. What does wholeness really mean? And I thought it was kind of interesting that the dictionary defines wholeness by what it's not. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. The state of being unbroken or undamaged. Um, it also talks about what it does, the state of forming a complete and harmonious whole. I think many of us think about wholeness as health. We think about wholeness as um, unity. Uh, we think of wholeness as completeness. Um, Ernest Holmes talks about the essence of wholeness in the Science of Mind. He writes, the spark which burns at the center of our own soul is caught from the living and eternal flame of spirit. So he talks about the source of our wholeness. And let me read that again. The spark which burns at the center of our own soul is caught from the living and eternal flame of spirit. Right. So we're not in this alone. We're in this together as a whole. And it comes from spirit and it lives in us and there's no place that it is not. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so when we think about this idea of wholeness, one of the things that we teach in this philosophy is that there's nothing we really have to um, uh, find or dig out or search that wholeness and all the qualities of God already live within us. There is no place that God is not. That's what the kids say. There is no place that God is not. And so if, if it's true that we are inherently whole, that we are the embodiment of wholeness, well, has it, has it always been true? I mean, the scientists state that human beings have been inhabiting the planet for six million years. Six million years. That's a really long time. And does this mean that we've been whole the whole six million years that humanity has been in existence? Well, I think our teaching would say that's true. And I think that sometimes it's harder to see than others. Sometimes it's harder to have that, that acknowledgement or to a recognition of wholeness. And so this, this month we're really looking at in embracing wholeness and beginning to see it in all the many places that it shows up, even in the places that might be hidden. 
I have been musing about this idea of the trajectory of humankind over six million years and thinking about the evolution that our species has gone through. And, and then, of course, I'm looking at this month in December. There's a, quite a few holidays that we recognize in December. And looking at how these holidays come forth for us to remind us of the light, to remind us of our wholeness. <clears throat> we have the, um, in the Northern Hemisphere especially, um, we have this uh, time period where even in Southern California, it gets a little dark, it's a little sooner, <laughs> right? It gets a little chillier. My, my heater's been on a little more than it has all year. Um, yeah, we have this time of year where it, uh, the light is diminished. There's less light, there's less um, warmth. And so uh, many of the holidays at this time of year recognize and remind us of the light. We have the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah, which is the commemoration of the taking back of the temple and then consecrating it with the oil that they didn't think would last for seven days. It's called the Festival of Lights. And so we have that um, place in December that uh, honors the light and the return of the light. We have Bodhi Day, that just maybe less popular, less lesser known, but Bodhi Day is usually um, December 8th, and it honors the day that Siddhartha was enlightened and transformed into the Buddha, that master teacher that has so much wisdom to teach us about suffering and being present. And so here, again, we have this demonstration of light. Um, and the pagans celebrate Yule, or you may know it better as the winter solstice. It doesn't always show up on the calendar as Yule. And this is the celebrating of the rebirth of the sun. It's ancient and indigenous to many cultures, this practice of honoring the solstice. And then, of course, very popular in Northern America and in uh, Northern European countries is the celebration of Christmas, which is that opportunity to recall and to celebrate the birth of the Nazarene, the Christ, that ha came to help liberate, if you will, humanity. And all these, these traditions and all the mythology below it um, give us an opportunity to examine where we are when the days are getting shorter, when the nights are getting chillier, when there's so much busyness and chaos around us. And our opportunity is to go within and to come back to that place of knowing this highest truth about the light that lives within us and all around us. And so when I think about like six million years of existence, I mean, it's, it's, I know that there's so many zeros, people don't, you don't even really know what that means, right? And all of these different uh, recognitions of light, all these recognitions of our blessings, really only came about in the last three or 4,000 years. Like we have like six million years, and then we have, it's not even a fraction. <laughs> like, you know, if you try to figure out how many, how much, what percentage of six million is, you know, what percentage of uh, six million is 4,000, it's not even a fraction. And then if you think about new thought, the philosophy that you're here to honor and to d dive deep in and to really uh, saturate yourself with, new thought's only been around for 200 years. Like, I think, I can't count the zeros when I try to divide that into six million. The new thought uh, really only became uh, prevalent in, in the early 1800s, and, so, and, and science in mind, 100 years. So, so we are really in our infancy in this, um, I'm gonna use this term that means something else, but it, 
means something to me this morning. We're in our infancy in this true age of enlightenment. I know the Europeans in the 17th and 18th century refer to an age of enlightenment, but I'm really talking about the enlightenment when we begin to recognize that the light lives within us and that all the light that we see around us is a reflection and a projection of the light within. And so I'm a big fan, if this is my third Christmas with you, my third holiday season with you, and I'm a big fan of uh, ritual and looking at the different practices of the different holidays and seeing how we can metaphysicalize them. <laughs> and so I have one of the, one of the uh, traditions that I really like is the Advent because it prepares us. It's an opportunity to, to prepare us for something. Now, I've already said, you're already whole, perfect and complete, so what do you got to prepare for? The greater revelation of that truth within you. The greater understanding and knowing of the wholeness that lives within you. Because we have the human experience, despite the fact of being whole, perfect, and complete, we have the human experience of bumping into each other, um, struggling, uh, being oblivious to other people, being you know, super compassionate to the, the ills of the world, and everything in between. It's that human experience where sometimes we don't experience the wholeness. And so I think the holidays give us a beautiful uh, runway to look at wholeness. And so Advent and, and how we can have a greater revelation of that. So Advent, um, I have a, a little Advent wreath here warning the camera crew I'm going to move over here <laughs> so the folks at home can watch this. And we have three purple candles and one pink candle. It represents hope, peace, joy, and love. The pink candle represents joy. So, but I'm go so I'm going to light the candle for hope this morning. And I thought we would explore hope a little bit. Because, you know, we have an interesting relationship with hope as religious scientists. Ernest Holmes has this to say about hope. He says that hope is good, but it is better, because it is better than despair, but it is a subtle illusion and is an unconscious compromise. And so on, Ernest Holmes, who wrote the Science of Mind textbook, cautions us about hope. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing to hope. But we need to recognize that we might not be going all the way. We might not be all in with faith if we're only relying on hope. He also writes that if it were not for the divine hope in us, our experiences would be more than the human mind could digest. And in, in the latter statement, he's really talking about our ability to access divine intelligence. And he's, he, he states that there's really two ways that we, we access divine intelligence, that it moves through us, that we have access to it, that it, everything that we experience is a result of this divine intelligence. And we, we either access it through intuition and inspiration, or we access it through bitter experience. And he posits that bitter experience is usually the place that wakes us up so that we can then reach past our mortal experience to draw from divine intelligence. And so hope has its place. It has its place when we doubt. It has its place when we lose our way. But it needs to lead us to faith. It needs to lead us to that knowing. It needs to lead us to the truth of the um, our wholeness that already exists, even if we're not having that experience at the surface level. If we look at some of the other uh, religions that we are that are recognized uh, this time of year, there was hope with the 
Jewish people, there was hope that the oil in the lamp would be enough to consecrate their temple. And then, of course, with the Buddhists, there's a hope that one day each practicing Buddhist, Buddhist would realize enlightenment. And, of course, with the pagans in ancient times, the hope that the light would return, that the sun would be reborn. So there is a place for, for hope for us to begin to move towards a greater revelation of our wholeness. And as we rekindle our faith through the practices of the holidays, through the practices that you'll see out and around you, we have an opportunity to recognize them in some of the holidays that you might be practicing. Because the truth is, as a religious scientist, we don't really celebrate holidays. I think, you know, tongue in cheek, the only holiday we really celebrate is Groundhog Day. <laughs> right? But many of us, you know, we, I love, cel you know, the, the decorations. I love the lights. You know, I like watching the boat parade in the harbor. I enjoy going downtown and seeing all the, the trees that are decorated. It, it brings up a sense of awe. And, and I think awe is important as we move back towards that understanding of our wholeness. It, it opens our hearts. It allows us to, to see all the beauty that is around us. It, it allows us to raise our awareness to the greater good that's around us. I was uh, reading Richard Rohr this morning, and he talked about awe. Um, I love when that happens. I think about something, and then somebody prints something, and it comes right before me. It's such a wonderful um, synchronicity. So he wrote, I think people who live their lives open to awe and wonder have a much greater chance of meeting the holy than someone who just goes to church but doesn't live in an open way. We almost domesticate the holy by making it so commonplace. And I was thinking about that because, you know, isn't, isn't he kind of talking about like the over-commercialization of Christmas, <laughs> right? He, you know, it, he's, he's talking about when we lose sight of the beauty and the power and the depth of the awe that is all around us. And so we can move through this holiday season with our eyes open and our hearts open. We can use the rituals of bringing a live tree into your home. <laughs> to, to, you know, maybe we started doing that many years ago because it helped us to reconnect with the, the natural world and all the beauty and the power that it is is within the natural world, especially in the northern hemisphere when things tend to, except for in southern California, <laughs> things tend to die down and, and uh, turn brown. Uh, we, we have our brown. We definitely have our brown. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a, a beautiful tree here in our sanctuary representing the light and the, the, the wonders that we celebrate during Christmas. I think it's important that we remember our practices. And the practices that I'm really talking about are gratitude and forgiveness and compassion. And whether you um, have some family traditions that are Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or perhaps agnostic, I think we can all relate to forgiveness and compassion and generosity. That this is the time of year for us to remember that, to bring it forward. It would be lovely if we did it all year long. But certainly in December when we, many of um, the, the beings that we share this planet with, their, their awareness is heightened as well. And so we have this opportunity to, to hope that our brothers and sisters, that their awareness will stay with them a little longer, that that trajectory of six million years that has brought us to this moment 
of enlightenment, if you will, of the knowing that there's a divinity that lives within us, that it is not something we have to get. It is something that we have to express. And so that is where I, I have hope. And, I'm, and I move myself to faith and knowing. And then I watch the news. <laughs> and then I have hope. And I move myself to, to knowing. Um, that, that is our work as religious scientists, to, to hold the high watch and to be gentle when our, with ourselves when we miss the mark, when we fall down, when we start judging the world as bad, when we start not seeing the wholeness all around us. Yeah, we need to be gentle with ourselves because it, this is a practice in this particular philosophy. It is a practice where what we see in the outer world is actually temporary versus the truth and the beauty and the power of the thing that makes the grass grow and the source that we recognize all year long, not just in December. I'm going to sort of bring us back to this idea of elevating our awareness to our wholeness and, in, and beginning to really embrace it in a visceral way and to do that in all our interactions and to recognize that wholeness in all the people around us, to pay attention when we judge, Pay attention when we look around us and we decidedly don't feel like things are whole. I found myself this week, we were in an ecclesiastical meeting and we were talking about the categories and the themes this month and I kept hearing myself say, yeah, we move from brokenness to wholeness. And I kept using that word brokenness. That wasn't very good of me as a religious scientist. <laughs> Again, it's that human condition thing. And so where is it that we fixate and where is it that we put our attention and can we lift ourselves up to see the wholeness in ourselves and in each other? And when we do that for ourselves and when we do that for each other, we do that for humanity. And we can't help but have an impact because humanity looks very different than it did six million years ago. We have evolved. We have experienced more light in the world. We have generated a greater awareness of that light. I'll leave you with this, I, this thing that I read in the Science of Mind chapter. On the it was in the Principles of Successful Living, and Ernest Holmes writes, there is no medium between us and the universal mind except our own thoughts in such degree as we place a medium, we have to absorb that medium before we can make a direct approach. Do you hear that? We have to absorb whatever we have placed between us and God in order for us to recognize our wholeness and our oneness because we do it over and over again. We place all kinds of mediums between us and God. He goes on to say, that the Bible teaches that there is no mediator between God and humanity except Christ. And then he goes on to remind us that Christ means the truth about ourselves, the truth of our divinity, the, the model, the, the myth, whatever, however you hold that Christmas story and that Easter story, however you hold that, what I know is it's a representation of where divinity and humanity meet. And at that cross section of divinity and humanity is our wholeness. So as we move through this season, I'm gonna encourage you to remember that you are the perfect combination of divinity and wholeness. You are the perfect mixture of divinity and wholeness. You are the Christ. Come again.
as you. And that these holy days are there for us to really lean in and to know that highest truth about ourselves and about each other. Because I'm here to tell you there are no exceptions. There are no exceptions to this. And so let's remember that as we move through the, the advent of, of embracing our wholeness and we'll recognize our wholeness and we'll look for different ways that we can acknowledge it throughout this month. Tis the season to manifest hope and peace and joy and love. Thank you very much. So let's pray, shall we? That is one of our practices that brings gratitude and generosity and, and compassion and forgiveness to a real place within us. And so I just invite you to close your eyes and to imagine, if you will, that we live in a planet that is whole, perfect, and complete, that is inhabited by beings that are whole, perfect, and complete. That we recognize that wholeness every time we look into the eyes of another. That we see wholeness when we look in the mirror. Know with me that that is at one level a reality waiting to be embraced, waiting to be demonstrated, demonstrated daily and so as you walk into this high, holy season, the season of Hanukkah, the season of Bodhi Day, of Yule and Christmas and Kwanzaa, as we walk into these holy days, let us use them as a reminder, a reminder to see the awe in the everyday, to not take it for granted, to recognize God sitting next to us in the car before us and in the car behind us, in the line in the grocery store, in the homeless man on the corner. There is no place that God is not. And so as we move through this time of year, we acknowledge and we embrace and we recognize the beautiful truth of wholeness in all life. And so it is with deep gratitude that I simply anchor this law in this powerful truth. And I simply surrender myself to a heightened awareness, knowing the truth shall be known and that we know it already. And together we say, and so it is. Thank you very much. <laughs>